I gave you many, many problems similar to that. I asked you to calculate the internal forces and moment. This has nothing to do with chapter five, which is the shear and moment diagram, but at least when I did that, that should help you out. I mean, nobody should put here. I mean, many of you, I don't know, in this class, I gave the same, this time the same question to the both classes in order to check to see how they, how they are doing against each other, and both were bad, so let's put it this way. <laughs> so then, how can you put the load here, six kilonewton meter? That means people do not understand the significance of the uniform load versus a single load. Actually, when it is a static, we reduce this to a single load. That single load is 24. You put it at the centroid of the centroid, not center, centroid of the section. Because if it is triangle, you have to put it at the centroid, which is not at the middle. So therefore, you can remove that. And this is why I put it in dash line to be equivalent to a 24 kilonewton load there, which then gives you a reaction based on this distance. This distance is two, this distance is four. Therefore, you just calculate the reaction by taking moment about here and there. Many people, even when they calculate 24, then they put here 12 and 12. I don't understand that. This is not a symmetrical scenario. Is that understood? That is very simple. This is one third, this is two thirds. Nevertheless, if you take the moment, this becomes eight kilonewton, that becomes six. Third. This is a no-brainer. Everybody should do that. However, one third of class or more had a mistake there. Anyhow, in order to give you more credit, hopefully I was just divided the t together. So whatever you did there, I checked the rest of your quiz based on what you did here. So I gave this part five points, which is purely static, has nothing to do there. The, uh, then. We know also this fact, that the single load, as far as the static goes, you can do that. But as far as the strength goes, I cannot do that. Everybody understand that the single load totally gives you a different type of shear and moment scenario. We went through that. You had it in chapter one as well. I said it there. You should keep the load there when we cut the beam. Is that correct or not? Now, where are we cutting the beam? We are cutting the beam at two meter from point a, this was point A, therefore you have to cut it here. Look what you see there, you see a load there. Remember, you cannot make that mistake. There is a 16K here and there is a load here. If you put 24 there, where do you put it? This side, that side, I mean that's, no, no. Because what you have here, as if this is the weight of the beam. Everybody understand that? We talk about it many times. So, and nevertheless, this is 16 kilonewton. Then you have now a load which is not 24. It is only f six times two meters. So it is 12 kilonewton, which represent that one. You can show either that or that, not both of them together. That's why, again, we show that in dash line. And then, of course, in general, you need to calculate shear at that point and the moment of that point here, we did not care about the shear. I didn't ask for that for that one. You only need the value of moment. So you take the moment, not about the A. Let's say this is point A. I gave you, oh, there A is sitting there. I'll give you A, B, C. Now let's say this is point D and this is point D. You need the moment at point D. Is that correct or not? Therefore, you take sigma M at or about d equal to zero. So you have 16 times two negative plus 12 times one because this 12 multiplies by one plus m d equal to zero or m d equal to 20 kilonewton meter. And most importantly, the, it is this way. If it is this way, the top will be in compression and the bottom will be in tension. If it is other way around, you have to change the direction of the tension and compression. Actually, in several of the homework that I did in class for you drawing the shear and moment diagram, I had a uniform load there, and I replaced it with a single force. Even if you forgot chapter one, or your static, or your general knowledge, it was there in front of you. I did it eight, 10 minutes ahead of you, repeat that process. However, in this class, in the other class, about one third of people could not replace that force with 24 kilonewton. Very bad. They did not calculate the reaction at A and 
be? I mean, how can you go through a system like that and do not calculate the reaction? I have no problem. Many people draw only that part without this. I mean, how can that be? I don't understand even the, what is the logic behind their approach. Anyhow, this has about five points. Then the next part of it is the static part of it again. That is what I mentioned many times. I said, as long as you know how quickly you calculate the area of a circle, yes or no, or area of a trapezoid, or area of something here and there, then moment of inertia replaces the area. So you have to be very good at it. I mean, you cannot go through the strength of material without knowing the Y bar and moment of inertia. In this chapter, next chapter, next chapter, is everywhere. It's actually in many times when we want to calculate sigma, you have to use moment of inertia instead of area. Is that understood there? So for that part, which is again a static, this is purely static, has nothing to do with the strength of material. This is also a static. Many problems there. Some people even as if they never heard about parallel axis theory. I give you the homework and there are six of them requires parallel axis theorem and then I give you one which is much, much simpler than what you had in your homework and you fail at it. It's obviously you have not done your homework correctly or you copy it from the book or whatever you did. I don't understand that. Anyhow, this is such a simple case. You put your x here, you assume that is the y bar. Is that correct or not? And you have two, three area, one, two, and three. Of course, one and three are the same because it's symmetrical. So you don't need a table because this is only two, because these two are the same. All you have to do multiply it by two. When you use the table, many of you are using still the table. You use the table if there are three or four or five. Is that correct or not? In this case, all you have to do, write y bar. The numerator are the q's of this area, and the denominator is the area itself. So q of this area is simply 30 by 100, yes or no? That's the representation of the area. Where you put it at the center, so you multiply it by 50, and all you have to do, multiply that by two, because one is here, one is there. And I said, do not do it in meter, because you, some of you use meter point o, o, and then made mistake here and there, I don't, because the number become too small. I said, use it in millimeter, then at the end, convert it to meter at the end. Nevertheless, this is the easiest way to do it. And then plus Q of this part. So Q of that part is 150 times 30, because this is 150 times 30. You put the mass here. You take the moment about here. Multiply it by 15. So many people got that part right. And then the areas are 2 times 30 times 100, which is 1 and 3 and then plus the area of this one, which is 150 times 30. Anyhow, this end up to be 35 millimeter. And you should do it in millimeter, not in meter, so that's the answer. Then you put your neutral axis now at this point, because this is the real centroid of this picture at 35. So this distance is 35, and that distance is 65. And that is where the stress is going to be equal to zero, et cetera, et cetera. Next, you need the moment of inertia with respect to the neutral axis. There are at least five or six, seven people who do not even use parallel axis. To, I said, no, no. OK, for this one, I have 112 of base, which is 30, times height to the power of 3, plus area times distance squared. What I wrote here is the moment of inertia with respect to x prime. I'm taking the moment of inertia now with this, this, this line, which is passes through the centroid, not this one. This is out. Some people take the d from here. That was for centroid. Now your axis, that is reference axis, is here. Passes through the neutral axis. I'm calculating i with respect to this, or you can call it xc. This is with respect to x prime. There is a difference between the two. This is 65. This is 50. So this should be 15. So multiply area, which is 30 times 100, times distance square, which is 15 square. Now, there are two of them. And how many people repeat that twice? I don't know. You are wasting your time. They are all symmetrical. Therefore, you multiply that by 
2 plus moment of inertia of this one, which is plus 112 of base. Base on that is 150. 150 times 30 to the power of 3. This is 30 to the power of 3. Then again, this is the moment of inertia with respect to this axis. And I need this much distance, which is 15 plus 5. So that is equal to 20. Yes or no? So it becomes area plus area, which is 150 times 30 times distance square, which is 20. Anyhow, this number also become very large. Some of you writing 8 million, 490,000, 88,000. I don't know to do that. That's not necessary. I said carry it to three digit or use 10 to the power of three or 10 to the power of six. Some of you are still using 10 to the power of seven somewhere, eight somewhere else, four somewhere else. Those are all become part of a mistake you are making, so you don't want to do that. All you have to do, right, use three digit. This is 8.49. I don't need more than three digit. Times 10 to the power of six millimeter to the power of four. And of course, to convert that to the meter, I said go from plus 16, plus 6 to minus 6. Minus six. That's right. Uh, we discussed that. So times 10 to the power of minus. So it become, So you start here on meter, so that would work. But you don't need to do that. But the numbers become too small to add or to subtract. Then there are lots of possibility of mistakes. Everybody understand <coughs> that. Here, the numbers are larger. You just truncate that to the three digit. Everybody understand? Yes? This is always where we do that. Now, you did this part correctly, you get seven point, you get this part correctly, probably you get five point, already 12 point is there, which is purely has nothing to do with the strength of material. You are doing all the static, yes or no? Now, putting a strength of material, actually this was very simple, no brain it. Now, on the top is compression, on the bottom is in Tension, therefore, sigma max in compression, sigma max in compression, which is on top, should be negative because compression is negative. Some of you are not using negative, and that's why if you go to the strain, you probably make a mistake. So your M, the M is 20 kilonewtons, so 20 times 10 to the power of 3 newton meter multiplied by the C, which is 0.065 because that's the 65 that we are have here. This is neutral axis. This is maximum compression here, maximum tension there. And therefore, divided by I, 8.49 times 10 to the power of minus 6. I ask you to keep that for your mega. Do not put it there. So you leave that out. You multiply it or divide the rest of it. Become minus 153. This goes to the numerator, become 10 to the power of 6, which become, become mega. So it become that many mega pascal. Is that correct or not? OK, out of class of 45, plus one or two people got it right. Too bad. That's why it was so bad at the beginning this morning. Now I'm relaxing a little bit. So first class, I really was bad. I gave the same question, and many people cannot do the static. Many people cannot do the moment of inertia. That's no good. You cannot become an engineer without knowing this. Everybody understand that. It's very simple. That part, you just plug it in in your equation. And then sigma max in tension, of course, is the lower part because of this format of the moment. Again, one more time, this moment end up to be like that. If it was reverse, you have to change the direction. Anyhow, that's the same. You can use the ratio because it's linear. Remember that you, the ratio is 35 over 65 of that. You get 153 multiplied by 35 divided by 65. Or you can rewrite it again. Many of you rewrote it again, write it again. So I'm doing the same thing. It's not necessary. 0. 0.035 divided by the same i. And this time it becomes equal to 82.5 megapascal. OK, we got, this is basically 16 point. Now we get to the last point. I purposely put that in. Why I put it in? First of all, I already explained that in class to you. You should already know that. Nobody did it correctly. Maybe one person did it correctly. I don't think anybody did it correctly because you are not paying attention to the system. The system is not sigma equal to mc over i. The system is distribution of the stresses in the Cross section, yes or no? So I ask you a simple question, guys. If there is a pressure, a wind pressure coming from here, guys, 
I said that in class before, with a let's say intensity of five pound per square foot, yes? And here, let's say this board is fit, the wind goes like that. This is high school question. Let's say this is four feet by four feet. So how many square feet is that? 16 feet. How much force do I have there? What's the total force there? Five times the force. What is the stress? Stress is force per square inch. Everybody understand it. So I need to calculate the sigma. This is last part. So I need to calculate the force sigma always equal to force over area. Exactly what we did that. Is that correct or not? That's the area. The, you want to calculate the force. You get the pressure. Here was the wind pressure. Compression is pressure. Tension is a vacuum. Is that correct? The forces are going in. The forces coming out. So how much area do I have? I have this much area. Yes or no? I need sigma applied to that, exactly like that board. Is that correct? Why? Because I keep telling you guys, this is the lower part. You don't see that. This is the beam you see just at the dash line here. This is the beam, what we show here. Is that correct or not? Is that the beam? The moment is like that. You already calculate this number to be equal to minus 150, what was it there? There, 153. Here is your centroid. This is forces are going in. I did that in class for you. Remember one example. You are now recall what I said here. Here, the forces are going out. Yes. We are in that area. Is sigma constant? So if it is not constant, I have to integrate that. Now, why did I put this, did this system there? Chapter 6 is about that. Everybody understand. I purposely put it there, at least if you didn't do it in your quiz, at least now you learn it. Is that correct? Or hopefully you learn it better. Is that understood there? So if you want to calculate the amount of force applied to here, if the stress was uniform, look, is this one. This was a uniform stress. I would multiply the stress by the area. But the stress is not 82. This is 82.5. Where is the stress? The stress is there is a little bit less, so I have to average it. Is that correct? So if I want the average, like what I said here, but this was in compression, the other one is in tension, doesn't matter, as I said, or a pressure or a vacuum. Exactly what you are doing with your tire. You go to the gas station, you put wind in, I mean air into the, your, your tire, you are saying 30 pound per square inch. So that's the force, isn't it? 30 pound per by definition, stress is the amount of force per unit of area. This is, I have this much area. Is that correct? So I need the sigma for that area, but everybody should know that sigma for that area is not constant. Since it is linear, I can average it, yes or no? So in other words, I have to use this much average. Is that then it becomes uniform. And I did it in class for you many times. Anyhow, sigma for point A, let's call it point A here. If this was the point A, I have to calculate sigma there and sigma there. I already have this sigma. I have to calculate that sigma and then average it, then multiply it by area. Is that correct? Or I did it in class for you. Probably you forgot all about that. So sigma A, you can use the linear, become equal to, let me put, put the, this distance is only five millimeter. So you calculate that sigma, that sigma at point A, which is on the top of that part two. So it becomes equal to the same, m times 0.005, because that's the y, divided by the i, and then that becomes equal to 11.8 megapascal. And sigma average for the total part two becomes 11.8 plus 82.5 divided by two, so it becomes equal to 47.15 megapascal or 47.2, then you say, okay, the force equal to, apply this, is 47.15 times 10 to the power of six, which is Newton per meter square, multiplied by the distance, the, the area, which is 150 by 30 millimeter square, or then multiplied by 10 to the power of minus six, so it becomes meter square, so meter square, and meter square, meter square, it becomes in Newton. So F becomes actually uh, 
212,175 uh, 212, newton or equal to 212 kilonewton. That's the amount of force being applied to that, which I only give a minimum of four points. Some people got one or two, depend what, what they did. But ne nobody finished that part. Is that understood? Yes? This is go to your note. I already have done that. I made a big, as I said, uh, I, make, I ask you to all look at the distribution of stress in the cross section. The only time that, however, there are people who are using sigma equal to P over R. For heaven's sake, where is the axial load here? In order a beam to have an axial load, you have to load it like this guy. This is axial load. Everybody understand what happens. Why you are using P over here? I have no clue. At least 10 people use for sigma equal to P over A. That means not even they don't understand the bending action. They don't understand the effect of axial. The axial load is when you load the member like this. Yes, or being a beam or being the rod, doesn't matter. It has to be like that. In order, force has to be perpendicular at in the cross section. Yes. Um, for that uh, 150 times 30 times 10 to the negative 6, is that the area that you used? Yeah. Oh, yeah, because that's the area of this part, part 2. Why would you use the area of the whole? Um, I said how much force is in section on the 2. I then so for the bottom part, look at where the two is. I made it in color, I made it yellow, that you will see that. Yes? Yeah. Of course, you could, you could calculate how much force goes. That's your question, but this is not what I, he's asking for that. That's not what I ask. Yes? Correct? <coughs> now, that force that coming in, <laughs> if this wants to come in, you have a stress here, yes or no? Look what I'm getting at. Now we are getting to the bot. See, the, my problem is not this guy, sir. We have so much, so short of time we are. My problem is why, why you didn't answer this question, because what we are going through now, if that was this level, now we are, I'm going to discuss this level. Do you understand all of that? Is that correct or not? Look, if there are forces going to be pulling this out from this part, separately from this part, must have having a Stresses, that's the subject we are going to talk about there. Horizontal stresses, shear stresses in the beam, and vertical shear stresses in the beam. But before I go to that, I need to clarify a few ideas in the, but what I'm trying to tell you guys that you should put a little bit more emphasis on the detail, not on the formula. Again, for the last, last time, which Apparently, you are not doing. Of course, this I cannot say anything because this is basic static. Everybody should do that. Now, before I go to chapter six, I'm going to spend at least 10, 15 minutes on the one more shear and moment diagram, hoping that all of you over the weekend did all your homework. I hope that's true. Probably not. <laughs> then you will come to the office hours today because we have two more weeks to go. Two very, very important chapter, very complex chapter to do. And then we have the final immediately on Tuesday, one day, you don't have time. So your preparation should have started a week ago, going back to everything, studying that. And then I see this kind of result, it worries you. Nevertheless, my suggestion to you, I don't know whether you heard this or not, no matter what, if you get A or B or C, as long as you get the passing grade for ME student I'm talking about. Take 219, the whole 219 again, because this chapter 4, 5, 6, 7 is going to be repeated there. You need that anyway, even if you get A. Is that, uh, do not get the 219 cap. Is that understood? This is my suggestion, whatever you want to do. Is that understood what I'm saying? That depends on your schedule. However, it gives one more credit, but it gives you a more understanding of the subject. Nevertheless, there is a problem. Oh, it's not in your handout, so please write it down. This is a beam. We want to do it quickly with, because there is a new, uh, new point in this one, which I mentioned it last time near the end of the class. However, I want to reemphasize that one more time. This is 12 foot long, and half of it loaded like this, half of it uh, load of five kips per foot, and the distance from here to here is six feet. So six feet, six feet, and three feet here. 
and there is a load of, I need to look at my solution here, not to make a mistake there, and 18 kips there. So this is repeat. So I, I'm trying to avoid all the detail that I did before. Go quickly to several points here that you have to be aware of that one, which already been mentioned, is repeat. First thing is first, you replace this force with the 30 kips force, because it's five times six, and you put it at the center, for those of you who made mistake in your quiz. So this, you can do it for a static only. Everybody understand that. You cannot do it for shear and moment diagram, because a shear and moment diagram for a uniform load is a parabola for a single load or line. Everybody understand that? That's not replaceable, totally wrong. It's in chapter one. I gave you those homework in chapter, in first class. There are five of them in your, look at, go back when you are reviewing, look at all your homework one. All of this were there. Is that understood there, correct? <coughs> then you put the 30 kips there, then you find the reaction here by taking moment about point A or point B, or let's put B here, or point C. D is not really a good point to take the moment to find this reaction and to find that reaction. This reaction ends up to be 18 kilonewton, 18 kips, these are kips, not kilonewton. 18 kips, and that reaction ends up to be, I believe, 30, we correct, kips too. So this is the free body diagram of the, I mean, how can you go in your quiz, do anything without finding the reaction at A and B? I have no clue there. At least 10 people did that, so I have to make a complaint one more time. <laughs> so therefore, you do, draw your shear diagram. Now, the shear diagram is very simple. What's the value of shear diagram here? The shear diagram there is going to be plus 18, correct or not? If you have done your homework, this is going up, the shear is going down, so you start at plus 18. This is the shear diagram, will be in kips. And then after that, we are reducing it <coughs> by this area, if you, you use area method, or we are reducing it by 30, but gradually, yes, no, because one foot is five, two feet is 10, so, so it is a gradual until we get to point B. To point B, we should get to minus 12, because plus 18, minus 30, you end up, you will get minus 12, but it is a linear, because it is, the load is constant, the shear is linear, that's the slope of it. Actually, they, that, that value, five, <coughs> It's the slope of this line. Is that correct or not? Yes? Anyhow, <coughs> we go to minus. Then nothing happened here. This is the shear diagram. It took until point C. But there is no changes there. <coughs> or no area to be added or subtracted. Then suddenly we have this single load, which we have to go up, end up to plus 18 for a minus 12. So it ends up to plus. Nothing changed that to point D, and then we go down. Yes, correct? And notice this part is plus, this part is minus, minus, and this part is plus because this beam behaves differently. We'll get into that later. Now, what happened here? We are adding a new point to our system, which is the most important point. Look what happened here. Because remember that the moment is integral of the shear, yes or no? This shear is positive until point, let's call this one point E. So we have point A, we have point B, we have point C, we have point D. Suddenly this point, some people miss this point. If you miss point, you miss the whole idea there. At this point, look, moment is going up, 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 and suddenly must be going down because of negative. So at that point, the, you get the peak of the moment. So that's the maximum moment. Is that correct or not? And that is by calculus, that's correct. Because every time you want to calculate the maximum of minimum of fx, what do you do? You take the derivative, you set derivative equal to zero. What's the derivative of moment? The derivative of moment is shear. So when shear becomes zero, moment become? Everybody getting the point? Yes or no? Therefore, I have to calculate this distance. This is the most important point. That distance, which you can use similar triangle. I show you two methods. There are several methods. One is simpler than the other one. One method called this distance A. Of course, this distance from E to B, from A to E is A, from E to B is 6 minus 
A, is that correct or not? And use similar triangle, which is the following. A over 18, A over 18 equal to this divided by 12 in magnitude. So equal to 6 minus A divided by 12 using this over that, this over that, which is similar triangle or tangent of this equal to or whatever you want to use, that's the same thing, similar triangle. Is that correct or not? Yes, you calculate value of A to be equal to 3.6 feet. So at 3.46, the shear become equal to zero, but the moment become A, highest value. Is that correct? Or not? Whether that's the highest in the entire beam or not, but at that point, the by parabola should be going Higher, is that correct or not? So what we are trying to do is the following, guys. So here is your moment diagram. This is your M. Start at zero. This is point A. This is point B. This is point C. This is point D. This is X. I know from A to E, which is 3.8, it should be a parabola going like that. Then that would be the maximum. Is that correct? What's the, that magnitude? How do I do that? I have two methods, guys, to do. One is? Cut an equilibrium. I said what to do. We have to cut the beam where? We have to cut the beam at distance A, which is 3.6 meter, yes or no? Or feet, I'm sorry. So this is one method I show you all last time. By using, notice, the last time the method I used was either cut at B, C, and connect those points together, or was the area method? I'm going to show you all of them, all, both of them repeat. Again, if you have done your homework, you know what I'm talking about. It should be very easy, but from the face of you, I can see that as if you are hearing the, for the first time all of this. Too bad. Sorry, guys, no more help from me. The rest is my lecture. There are your own or your own. Whether I collect this homework or not, I, I don't care about that 20s that you are, many of you copying it anyway. All this question is going to be in the final, the next two chapters. Whether you want to do your homework, it's your, your decision. Everybody understand that those questions, this question, that question, chapter seven, which is coming after chapter six, is all going to be in the final because I have to prepare you for yourself for the new Everybody see that. So this is what you do. You make a cut. At a distance of what? 3.6. So therefore, you put here 18, and you put here the load, which is 5 kips per foot. Obviously, the load is how much? The load is 18, because it has to be 0. Yes, or she must be equal to 0. So that's 18k as well, because this is 5 kips at the middle of 3.6. And then, of course, shear at E is equal to zero. We are looking for M at E. Now, I said I show you two methods here. This is one method. This method was similar triangle. Of course, some of you will decide, no, this, I don't want to do that. I want to get rid of that 18 kips, yes or no? This is 18 kips is upward. These forces are downward. If I go one foot, how much do I get? I get five. Everybody see that? I go two feet. 10, 3 feet, 15, 4 feet is 20. Therefore, it's somewhere in between. Isn't it? All you have to do, this is one method, method one. Method two, you say, OK, I want to get the half plus 18. I want minus, and that is 5 times A. Everybody understand that, which is much simpler to me. But you have to understand what you are doing there. So A become equal to 18 divided by 5, which is 3.6. I have to go 3.6 feet in order to get rid of 18 kips of force, shear force, in order to make it zero. Everybody understand what I'm saying that mathematically? Yes? Correct? Did you get it? Did you get it? This method, second method? No. I can say it in your face. Our faces are obvious to me. I want you to understand again one more time. I can say it from your face. You have 18 kips force going upward, and you have five kips per foot going yeah. downward. How far do I have to go to become equal to 18? At three feet is 15, at four feet, you know why you didn't get it? I want this, okay, I'm, I like you, you know that. You see, we have talked this before. I've given you an example for that, because you were not listening to me when I was talking. You were looking at me, but you were thinking about something else. Yes or right? Right or wrong? Right. 
Right, okay. So, <laughs> guys, that's what I'm saying, that quite frankly, when you are here, you have to pay total attention to the detail. And that's why you miss those stuff, because you are missing the little detail here. You have the knowledge, you are working hard to get there. So why not put a little bit more into it? Is that correct or not? And it, nevertheless, so that was simple enough to understand either method. Now here, we go to the free body diagram. Sigma Fy, of course, we already see that we don't need that. So sigma m, this is point D, or I call it point E, I'm sorry. This is point E, so sigma m at point E equal to zero, so we have 18 times 3.6 going negative, then plus 18 times 1.8, because half of this stays here, from here to here is 1.8, plus me equal to zero, and me become equal to 32.4 kips foot of the moment. So we have there. Now, could I have done that by area method? You see, that's the first method. Cut, free body diagram. I call it equilibrium, ecstatic. I'm using equilibrium. Everybody see that? Can I use alternatively the area method? However, if you are using area method, you, it's better that your shear moment, shear diagram to be correct. Because if your shear diagram is not correct, you're not even losing that, you're losing this as well. Everybody, that's the only problem with the uh, area method. In area method, everything should be correct. But this is what I ask you to do. All your homework that I gave you for that previous chapter, do the first few of them with the equilibrium method. Then when you get a little bit better at it, then start using the or area method, or double check it. Now we are checking it in a way. Now what did I end up with 32 point? That's equal to that area A1. Everybody see that? That is 18 by 3.6 divided by two, because it's a triangle, yes or no? You calculate that area, that area becomes 32 point, whatever I put there, 32 point four, was it, was it? Okay, 32 point four, that's right. At the area has the same unit. Now, from E to B, I have to, Again, draw another free body diagram. This time the free body diagram is not 3.6. It has to be six feet, or I can use the area method. Since my point is done and I don't have more time, at the rest of it, I'm going to use area method. But there are two methods. Draw another one up to six feet. Everybody understand that. Calculate the moment at point B or use the area method alternatively. Everybody see, both of them is the same. Is that correct? So this area, now calculate that area. This is uh, 2.4 times 12 divided by two. So that becomes 14.4, but it is negative. Look, this area is negative. So I've, at that point, I have to subtract 14.4 to get to the moment at B, so the moment at B become 18, and it still is a parabola. So we end up to 18, because the MB, MB become equal to, MB become equal to 32.4, minus that area, minus 14.4, so we become 18 kips foot, correct? And the rest is very easy, because from B to C, I have to subtract this much, which is 12 times six, this is six, so that is minus 72. Is that correct or not? And it is a line. So I go from 18 to minus 54, and then back to zero. Very simply got that. So really, by two points, point E and point B, you are done. Everybody see that? The rest is quick. However, you have to recognize part of it is a parabola, part of it is line and it is very simple and you should use that technique in all your problem. The point that I was making here guys, do not forget about when the shear diagram crossing the line, that's become a very important point. You have to add that point to the rest because the point that we had here originally was A, B, C and D point e is very important. Now, notice this moment is negative, this moment is if you want to design this beam, do you design it for plus 32 or you design it for minus 54? Minus 54, because that's that. That means, by the way, moment here is negative at this section. If I cut the beam, the moment in the beam is 54 going like that, because tension on the top, compression on the 
bottom. I'm going to go one step further. This is not required from you guys, but look what happened here. If you draw the deflection of the beam, in 219 we are going to talk about that. Deflection of the beam is going to become like that, it's going to become like that, like that. Everybody understand, because this one pushes this down again. Look, here is smiley face, here is the frowny face, plus minus. Everybody understands. So if you are a designer, you, design, you have to make this beam safe for not for plus 32. You have to make it safe for minus. minus 54, which is tension on the top, compression, and that's what you were doing in your quiz. Is that correct? You were not designing it, but you're just checking it, the stresses. Yes or no? So everything comes together. For the beam design, you have to go to the highest value, correct? And there are more to it. We'll discuss it in the design courses. Is that understood? Yes? What's the shear maximum? The shear maximum is 18, either here or there. Everybody, here. but here is plus, here is plus, these are minus, not, not important. One more point, one more point I'm going to make and then I'm going to go to chapter six. Hopefully I have enough time to cover some of chapter six today, otherwise we don't have time to do that. So one more point that people make mistake and this one, although the result Oh, by the way, the result of this is in your handout. I did drawing the shear and moment diagram is done in color in your handout. You will see it there. Yeah, you saw, I think. Yeah, is that correct or not? The area being shown, etc., etc. I use it for the design, but I'm skipping the design now in favor of 219 now. If I had time, I will show you how the design worked too, but I'm skipping that part. Now, there is another problem in your handout, so but don't look there first. Let me explain it to you, then you can look at the answer in, in there. So this one has a different loading. So it had, first of all, it's a cantilever beam, but the, the, the fixed support is at the left, not at the right. Couple of the example I did, it was other way around. Then it is 20 feet long, so it is 12 foot here and eight foot there. This 12 foot is, has a uniform load of, again, four kips per foot, which is a total of 48. Everybody see that, for 12 feet and then four kips per foot. So you have a single load 48 at the middle for static purposes only. And then you have a 60 kips load here. And then you have here a moment of 100 kips foot of the load there. And we want to draw shear and moment diagram. This one also need a little bit of explanation because people have done mistake in this one as well. Although it's been already explained to you, both of them. Actually, I explained this also at the end of lecture last time, but I didn't do it. Uh, I didn't finish it, uh, detail of it. So this is why I had to repeat it. Is that correct or not? Now, this is a determinate problem, so immediately you can remove the support, replace it with appropriate forces at moment, yes or no, correct? How much force do I have there? So I have here four times 12 is 48 plus 60, so I must have here a reaction of 100 kips foot, correct or not? Then of course I have a load here, a load there, a moment there, all of them affect here. I have to take sum it up and then write it with the reaction there. I'm not going to waste your time doing that. Again, hoping that everybody knows how to calculate the reaction from a static. Is that considering all the forces and all the couples? Yes or no? So that moment become in this direction, become 1,000, I'm sorry, 88, no, wrong, let's change it. It actually, I, I should give it in 1,588 kips foot, and that we call it MA. This is RA, and that is MA, and we are done there. Yeah. How the shear diagram works for this one, quickly. The shear diagram is start at 108 positive. Everybody knows, it's a very simple one. So therefore, I'm going to do that quickly. This is the shear diagram, start at 108, then 108 kips and reduce by 48 from here to here. Is that correct? So you go there linearly, so you end up to this is point A, this is, let's say this is point B, and this is point C. So at point B, this is point A. I should draw that underneath that. That's better, <laughs> not to confuse you. So therefore, here it is. So I start at 108 
add up to here minus 48, so it becomes 60, it's not in a scale. So you can put 60 here, and then you go all the way there, and you drop it by 60, so you end up to zero. Is that correct? The shear diagram, as I said, usually it's very simple. Is that correct or not? Now, the moment diagram. What, how does the moment diagram start here? I cannot do it here, so I'm going to do it here. So I need point A, I need point B, and I need point C. What's the mo sh moment here? Is there, what's the value moment there? It certainly, it's not zero. Is that understood there? You know, many people take it at zero. No, no, that's wrong. The moment is 1,588. The question is, is it plus or minus? Minus. 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 Correct? Everybody understand? Look, statically, this is plus. You see, this is what I want you to understand. This, 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 they are all external, as if you are in a static class. You are not in a static class. You are in ME218. You are concerned about the behavior of the beam under this loading. So you are talking about stresses in the beam. Stresses in the beam, remember what we did at your quiz? The stresses in the beam due to the shear forces and moment, which is the internal, yes or no? So shear and moment diagram are the internal one, not the external one. That's why everybody makes a mistake here. Many people start from here and go up it end up there, there in the final and quizzes and you know that's all totally wrong. The moment the action is here, you need this in the body of the beam in order to react. Is that correct or not? So is it plus or minus? <coughs> if the format is negative, yes or no? Therefore you should not start at plus. You should not start at in other words, this is the action, this is the reaction as far as the static goes. Is that correct or not? Therefore, you start here at minus 1,005. That's not my point about this problem. The point there, point E. This one, you should start from here. And then from here to here is a parabola, yes or no? So if I'm going the parabola, I have to go from here to here going like that. Now, tell me why I go like that and I didn't go like this. Remember, I have two choices, to go like that or to go like that. Why did I choose this one, not the other one? Any, any, why this is correct and the other one is not? Calculus, guys. Everybody who has read the handout that I gave you, look, from point A to point B, any inches or any foot that we go forward, we are adding, but we are adding less and less. So a slope of that curve should be reducing, not increasing. So as you see here, the slope is, because this is all integration, but if you do it like this, slope kept increasing. If this line was going up, if this line was like that, then you would go the other way. Is that correct? These are all being in the color in the handout, the previous handout, not this handout. This is all being there. It requires a little bit pay attention to you. I'm not going to subtract point because of that. You draw this at least a parabola, I give you the full credit. But I want to tell you the whole. See, I'm limiting my, your knowledge to certain things. I do not expect all of that. However, I'm for those of you who are good at it, I'm just giving the calculus part of it. Is that understood? So everything based on calculus and integration. Anybody who is good in calculus, as many of you are, so should be okay with it. Is that correct? The slope, these are all about integration. One is integral of the other one. Is that understood? That Nevertheless, it goes there. So from there on will be a line which is tangent to that one. But should I end up at zero or should I end up at 100? 100. Plus 100 or minus 100? Minus 100. Again, you see, this is the action. This is the reaction. You don't have to put it there. You just put it up there for your reference. Is that correct? So that's it. But here, this is the action, but the beam is not there. The beam is here. Everybody else. And that is the reaction. But this is the right-hand side. That's the left-hand side. Aesthetically, this is plus. Aesthetically, this is minus. We don't care about that. We are plotting this, this based on frowny face or smiley face. Everybody see that? Both of them are Frowny face, everybody see that? So therefore, that's end of negative. All of that makes sense. So you should end up to minus 100, and here is that. So that's it. Everybody, everybody show. All the questions that you needed to ask me to do all your homework is already been 
this cut not once, maybe twice. So it is required from you guys. Now, go to the solution manual. You see this picture, in the, that picture in the solution manual. Copy it, if I suggest that. Don't write it by hand because it takes time. Go to copy machine, copy it, and give it to the homework if you want to. I don't care. I give you the 20 point. Everybody understand that, yes? However, in the final, you cannot do that. Is that understood? That In the final, you have to do all of this. It is very simple. You have to learn it. And quite frankly, from what I saw in this quiz, I'm a little bit nervous, but I hope that that was a mistake you made and you are going to immediately correct that. Do not make that kind of mistake, hopefully, and we go forward from there. Now we are going to chapter six, okay? But before I go to chapter six, I'm going to show you the shear stresses one more time in a, in a beam. Now, what happened here, we talk about every beam. Let's, let's first of all understand what we are talking about. Here is the, let's say we have here a beam like that. I just put it very simple in order for two to get the idea there. there is, this is external load. That has nothing to do with the internal load, yes or no? When I make a distance here cut, in this free body diagram, first of all, I have two free body diagrams. One on the right hand side, one on the left hand side. So I have here a force P, which is external. You apply the load, you put a column there, or you put something there like this, and you push it down. Is that correct or not? Yes? In the body, we have two action now, in every beam. A shear and a moment, always. Notice the shear and moment diagram, we just do it all together. Now, what happened here? that in this section you have a shear force going up. Of course, for this problem, it's very simple. Shear must be equal to P. Is that correct? On the other side, will be equal at opposite. This is chapter six. We are now going to talk about the stresses. Write it down in your note. Go to the next page in your note. Stresses due to the shear forces in a beam. Correct? Now, did we, there is a moment there as well. But the moment already been discussed. You had chapter four and for the moment, bending moment. Now what happened here, that there is an action here, there is a reaction here, the other side equal and opposite. So as you see, tension on the top, compass. so this beam is going to bend like that. Everybody see that, yes? But in every part of it, there is a shear force and a moment which changes from here to here. Of course, this is very simple, as I said it. If it is too complex, but like the other homework, you have to draw the shear and moment diagram. And now the question is in chapter four, chapter five was about determining the amount of M and shear force. Is that correct? Chapter four was about finding the stresses due to the bending in a beam. Now we are going to talk about the stresses due to the shear in a beam. However, in chapter three, we also saw shear stresses there. Do not mistake these two together. Do, uh, that's why I'm going to, I remember I said I will do that later, to show you the shear stress in a shaft now. That's nothing to do with the beam. The beam stresses are totally, I want you to understand right out that the, the shear stress in the beam are totally different from Shear stresses in the shaft. Now I want you to, set to see the separation between the two. This was a shaft, guys, yes or no? And I put it under a torque like that. You remember all of that? What was the stress that due to that? The stress was tau was equal to Tc over J, yes or no? So let's go back to that and study that and see versus this that you can see both pictures together. So I can use it here. I need my eraser because I need to erase that. Let's say that you have here a shaft like this. And it's round. So cross section is like this, hollow or not. And you are putting it under a torque like this. And this is assumed this is fixed. Remember when we cut it here, the same idea there. So here is the external. Then I have here an internal equal and opposite. Then again equal and opposite. So what happened here, if I have a point here, what kind of a stress is there? Obviously, it is not a normal stress. It is a shear stress, yes or no? The value of the tau, so this is your torque. This is your torque, will be given to you, torque, torque. But the value of tau was equal to, we know that, was equal to Tc over J. 
What did we say there is the following, that in the cross section, if this was the cross section, when this cross section, a torque being applied here, at the center, the stress was zero. As we going outside toward the outside, the stress keep in a circular format. It's not like the beam there. So it was a circular, for example, at this distance, if I'm looking at this distance, you recall that the stresses were like that? Yes or no? And on the outside, which I'm going to show in color, was the highest value, and this was the highest value. Is that correct or not? So that is where the stresses is. So I put this in color in order for you to see. This was in, inside the shaft, and these are outside of the shaft. And let's say your point is sitting here. Is that correct or not? Now, what I have this rod for that is for that reason. Here it is. You are putting a torque like that. Everybody see that? A torque like that. Here is your point, correct? You make a cut. Here your cut. This is equal and opposite. So these two are in equilibrium. This is equivalent. Everybody we talk about that. So the torque is going this way. So the shear stress must be going like that, like that. I'm showing that side. Yes or no? Therefore, if I'm looking at this one more time, this point sitting here, the shear stress going this. Look at the dot. The shear stress going like that. Is that correct or not? Going downward, correct? So here it is. That's that element. I put that element here, right there. You see, this is this one. And then the shear stress going, this is the tau, going like that. Then that we said, if this is tau xy, we should go head to head, two to, because tau xy was equal to tau yx. Remember that? We, long time ago we talked about it. That's the state of a stress, yes, at that point. And the value, this is your tau. This is your t, this is your tau, and that tau is calculate that, tau become tc over j. The only question is, is this plus or minus? I gave you the sign convention. Is this plus or minus? Minus. All of that, you have to remember all of that, guys. Otherwise, we cannot understand chapter 6 and chapter 7. That's the whole thing. This was minus format, so you put here minus. If it end up like this, that would be? Plus, is that correct or not? Yes? This is the sign convention. Even if you didn't remember it from the past, write it down. And this is the sign convention we are going to use for here and there. Is that understood? Yes? So one more time, the torque, this is torque, not chapter 6. This is chapter 3. Remember I said I'm going to show you this state of stress for the shafts. Of, I, I, I ran out of time. I didn't do it. That's what, that's what I already done. The state of stress, look, doesn't make any difference. If the torque going that way, the stress going this way. So you put it either. If the torque going that way, the stress going to go that. So either become plus or minus. Everybody under. But you a stress going like this. What is important here that these two must be equal. Because if I call, if this is x, y plane, if this is x, y plane, remember we went there. We call this one tau x, y, and we call that one tau y, x. And we said these two are equal, long time ago. Remember when I show you the state of stress in general? Yes? Everybody with me? Yeah? OK, that is the state of stress for the shaft. Anytime you have a shaft, which comes again in chapter 7, you have to do that. Now let's say, look up what happened here. In this one, let's assume the cross section of the beam is it's not, it could be round, but I'm not going to avoid that, and show the cross section of the beam like that. So now here is the cross section of the beam, guy. Right? So I make a cut here. This is that cross section. So this is, in other words, looks like this. Is that correct or not? Yep. That's the cross section of the beam. I have a shear force going down this way. So this is the shear force going down this way. This is not that shear force. That was torsional shear. Everybody understand that. So though they're completely opposite to each other. However, this one is already been discussed in chapter one. This is standard shear going downward. Remember, we talk about that. That's the best part of it. Let's say this is 10 inches. I'm just going to give you some number. And this is 4 inches. So the area is 40 inch square, let's say put the shear force, this is the shear force, let's say the shear force is 4,000 pound going down, let's assume after, let's say this P was equal to 4,000 pound, so this shear force become 4,000 pound, this one is up, this one down, this is very simple, a static, is that correct or not? Now you are trying to find the stresses 
due to this shear form in this cross section? Yes or no? What do you know from chapter one? What was shear force equal to by definition? Shear force was equal to force over area. area. Correct? That's what we used there in chapter five. Many times in many examples. Yes, we did it for the bolt. We did it. We used sigma was force over area if it was uniformly distributed. Yes or no? So if I'm assuming, God, this is there is a big if. Unfortunately, that's going to change immediately. If, if the tau is uniformly distributed from top to bottom, which we call it tau average. Remember, every time I calculate that, I put the average there. The tau average for this cross section obviously will be force over area, correct or not? So for this one, tau average become equal to force, which is 4,000 pound divided by 40 inch square, so it become 100 pound per inch square, which we call it PSI. Is that correct? 100, again, pound per inch square, uniformly distributed from top to bottom. Correct? This is what we know. And if you don't know about chapter 6, this is what you should do, because that's so far what I told you. Is that correct or not? We did it for the bolt. We did it for different area. Remember the wood that they were sliding on top of each other? Yes, we did it in many problems. It was very simple. I put a little pieces here. We pushed it back and forth, and we just used the tau equal to it. However, this is tau average. Let's see whether it works or not. Now we know that tau xy must be equal to tau yx. Okay. So if I go to this point here, let's say I point here, somewhere here. I look at this cubic. This is a cubic material. Is that correct or not? What shear stress is coming down? If I show that one here, this is point A. Now, everybody should point, put your point A there. On this left side, I have a shear stress of how much? 100 pound per inch square going down. I have here down. Then suddenly, I can see from what we did there or everywhere else. On the other side, I have to put equal and opposite. And here, I have to put head and head. What this telling you? There must be a stress going this way as well. Yes? Correct? If there is a stress going downward, there must be a stress going. Look at it. Is that correct or not? That is why if you have, this is what, the, what happened later. If you have a bunch of paper like that, which you should go to your handout page one or two. You go to page two. Everybody has the handout. By the way, let me do, do, do this. First of all, you need the first page in color. How many of you have the first page in color? Did I give you? Oh, where are the rest of them? Oh, here they are. I have here, uh, if those of you who have in color, so if you don't have it in color, I'm going to give you the first page here. Please take the first page and <coughs> If you have it in color or you have it, I don't have enough for everybody. So please, here, yeah, share it together. If I, have, if I have extra, I will give it to you. You have it in color? No. You don't need it? No, I don't have it in color. You don't have it in color. <laughs> okay. Do you have it in color? Except, I know. You have it in color? Everybody have a color here? Okay, you are okay? I have three more if somebody wants. Here, pass it on. I have two, three more. Okay. No, I don't want you to go there. I want you to go to the second page, which I don't have. I only call because this one is the der derivation of equation. As you see, it's very complex. It's not that simple. So that equation, if I use this equation, which is the general equation for a definition of a stress, that means the stress from here to here is constant from top to bottom with a value of 100 pound per inch squared. Works here. First thing is first that there are stresses going Vertically, there must be stresses going horizontally. That's why when you make a beam like that, this beam, I hope you, everybody notices like that. This beam is four pieces. Everybody see that? If, I, if these four pieces were separate from each other, when I bend this like that, this end will become zigzag. So go to page two of your handout. Go to the next page. You don't have it. I, you have to print it your own. I don't know, guys. You should bring here your handout. Otherwise, I said without the handout, you will not... Actually, next, next one, which is the more circle, guys, 
is 20 pages. You need to print that. You need to keep it for this course, for next course, next course. Actually, that, that handout, should you all should keep it because that's my version of the Morse circle. Everybody else is using it. it. I made a seminar out of that. I want you, everybody, to print that and keep it out of because the books. You know, if you look at the page two here, you see, guys, you have to understand what we are talking about. If there are two layers, at the end it's going to be zigzag. Everybody understand that. Why? Therefore, if it is, you can see that I'm doing this bending and they are not moving because there are glues here because of this horizontal stresses versus vertical. So the first concept here, when I calculate this tau, I should have this tau as well. Is that correct or not? Everybody understand that. That's why this has to be glued. And if it is metal, it's bridges or something like that, you can see that I cannot glue it. I have to nail it in the case of wood. You just put all the plywood, you nail it. Otherwise, it will not stay there. It moves. Is that correct? And that's the shear forces. Is that correct or not? Or you have to bolt it together. You see all the big bridges there, the St. Thomas Bridge. Everybody has seen that. There are lots of bolts you see from outside. Those are all being there purposely for, otherwise this will not stay like that together. Is that understood? So the stresses are horizontal, vertical. Now, accepted that concept, let's go to the top. If we go to the top, this cubic, I have a stress, according to this formula, I have a stress of 100 pounds per square inch and nothing there. So that is not going to work. So that, the bad, this was the good news, which was so simple. The bad news that that formula is no longer valid. So therefore, never ever use that for a beam. Is that understood that? Because what end up here in this level, notice there is no force. Between the layer, there are stresses because I have to go. But on top, it's free. Is that correct or not? No stress here, no stress there. So stresses there, shear stresses there should be equal to? Zero, everybody understand? Because if I have no stress there, I should have no stress that either. Everybody understand what I'm saying there? So on top of the beam and bottom, is reverse of the chapter four. In chapter four, the top of the beam and bottom of the beam will getting the maximum tension and here is reverse. Shear stress on top is, write it down, is zero. Shear stress on the bottom is, Zero, because underneath there is no, nothing there, on top is nothing there, because there is nothing push, pulling it. Everybody see what I'm talking about? If I'm looking on the top of the beam, of that point, there is nothing here, there should not be nothing there. So actually, this become zero and zero, look, become exactly reverse of chapter four. Then naturally, the stress at the middle of the beam should be a little bit larger to compensate for that loss. Everybody understands. So it is no average. So anybody in the final, when they calculate how uh, there are students do that even in ME219, to come to use this equation for shear stress in the beam, that means they are ignoring chapter six altogether. Everybody understands. Chapter six is all about that. Now what happened next is we want to calculate first. What is the tau? Now here is the fact. There is a shear force there, the value of that 4,000, this was just an example, or 10,000 or 2,000, doesn't matter. I want to have, this is what we want to do. We have here a shear, a cross section. We have a shear force, and we want to calculate the tau according to the new formula, and how I have to come up with a new formula, correct? Yes? All right, now we have to go to the color page. Now, what I did here, because I'm going to make it a little bit short, because the math part of it is a little bit heavier than before, so let me put it this way. However, from what I gave you a quiz, you will understand that what I did here. So if you take a little piece of this beam, a slice of that beam like this, I have it here. Look, this is a slice. Is that correct? You bring that slice back here, down here, that's the slide, I'll show you a little bit bigger because this is the height of the beam. Here we don't show the height. Usually this is the height of the beam. This is dx. Usually you have here, as you saw in the moment diagram, you have an m here and you have here m plus delta m. So m keep changing. Did you see the shear and moment diagram? The shear diagram keep changing the moment diagram. As the result of that, look what happened here. Now go to the color. You don't have to write this down. You just listen to me carefully. This create, this is what we did in it. This create 
let's say this is the centroid, this create a compression, this create a compression forces, this create compression, that's what you see the green forces there. Everybody see the green forces there? One is from M plus delta M, you don't have to write it there, it's here. Right? The other one is M, of course M plus delta M is larger than M, correct or not? So which forces do you think is larger than the other one? So if, in other words, I calculate, I'm here at this level, first of all, this is what we do. We go here, this is the neutral axis, then we are at the distance of Y1 or distance of Y2. Y2 actually is equal to C, remember that? So if I am here and I want to calculate the shear stress here, tau, which is going downward and which is going to go horizontally as well, everybody understands. As soon as I calculate that tau, I have to put it here and here. Everybody see that? So there are two of them, horizontally and vertically. So in this analysis, this is what we did. We are here, this is the cross section of the beam. This is the centroid, this is the distance there. So I cut that part out like that. You see that green part there. So all I'm saying that from what you just saw in the quiz and what you see in your handout, these are forces going in this way and forces going there. But these two forces are not equal. Everybody gather that. That's all you have to know. Is that correct? Because these forces are larger than. So if it turns out to be forces on the right, and forces on the left, obviously FR is larger than F. So where is the balance of that? Balance of that is here. See, I have to add a little force here, and here equal and opposite to make it to equal. So if this is, let's say, 200 pound, for example, and this is 180 pound, 20 pound is left here, which goes into the, there, therefore it is sliding here. Everybody see in between the slides. So, now, if I can be able to calculate this delta F, or they call it delta F H, I don't know what I call that. You know, these are different books. Yeah, yeah. What did I call that one? Yeah, yeah, I call it yeah something. Yeah, delta F H. Yeah, F H. Yeah. So all I have to do calculate this force by integration or by averaging. I calculate this force, divide that, and find this force and multiply it by that area because this area goes like this. I want you to understand if the beam goes like this. So the area goes like that. This is delta x and this is t. The t is the thickness of the beam. This is the t. Is that understood that? Yes? So therefore, I find the stresses underneath here in order I find this force divided by that area. That's what I did there. So don't worry about it. What happened there? At the end, that tau equal to force over area goes out and this comes in which is, you see it at the end of your handout. You can read it at home. If you have any question, you want more about it, I will act that again. Now, two things happened. Look at the yellow area there on top. The yellow area when the green forces were. Is that correct or not? The dark, light green forces, yes? Not what they are doing here. The green forces are compression forces. Everybody see that? The blue forces are there tension forces, and we are not talking about all the green. We are only the green that on top that little part. Is that correct? Uh, that, that little part that, which is the yellow area on the side. And this is the cross section in general. So we, what you want to calculate, we are saying that the tau changes according to that formula. You know, you have to recognize all of that. What is the sh this quantity. This quantity, of course, is the shear force. We know that. So we have the shear force. We have here. You can get it from the shear diagram. What is the I? Notice I is because they are using M. The I is the same I as the moment. So it is I with respect to the neutral axis. That's no problem. So write it down. V is equal to shear force. So that will be given to you. I is equal to, of course, I with respect to neutral axis. Now, the only thing that added here, because I wanted to find forces from here to here, I have to integrate that from here to here. Everybody see that? That area that you see that, it is being shown yellow. Is that correct or not? So this is the Q, guys. The Q, because of this integration, you were somewhere there, there is an integral between Y1 to Y2 yda which is the q so you have to find out q uh, because somewhere there is your equation you will find y da because this is y da from y1 to y2 which that means the q of this area the yellow area which is above that line 
So whenever you want to calculate the shear stress at this point, you have to make a line there, and then Q is write it down. Q is the first moment of area above that line, which for your picture will come the yellow area. Everybody see that? Yes? Because look at the integration somewhere, there's YDA. You see that in the, uh, don't, at the middle of the page, you will see YDA, that's the Q. Is that anyhow? And the T, of course, will be this distance from here to here. So one more time, in order, because this is too confusing to, in this picture, this is what we do. I'm going to I just explain the formula to you, that's why it's said. Let's say that you have a cross section like this. So you have here, the, uh, uh, yeah, this is given. Is that the height is given, H, W is given. Of course, the shear force will be given to you. And then all you have to do first, find the neutral axis. You have to do it. This is symmetrical, so you don't have to worry. <coughs> neutral axis at the middle. Next, you have to calculate I. Then, let's say you want to calculate shear stresses here. Is that understood? This is the shear stress, which is uniform in this direction, variable in that direction. Is that correct or not? According to that formula. Therefore, all you have to do, make a cut there, everybody. So make a cut like that, as if this is you want to cut this into two pieces. Because now shear stress is going down, and shear stress is going horizontally as well. And that is this tau. So all you need, you calculate the v. I, you will calculate yourself Q of this area with respect to neutral axis, and the T will be this cut, because you have to go from here to here. That's the T, the thickness of the beam at that point. That will be the shear. Now, tell me, as I go down, when I go to the top, now, if I go here, what's the Q? Is there any material above me? The Q is zero. As I go down, the keep Q, because I get more area as I go. But I don't care about the area. I care about the Q of that area. As I go down, the Q keep. Where do you think the Q is maximum? On the neutral axis. If you go beyond that, the Q become negative. Remember that? Because Q of the above and Q of the above are equal and many times opposite. So don't go beyond the neutral. So where the, generally the shear stress become maximum? On the neutral. Reverse of chapter 4. So actually chapter 4, the stresses on top and bottom were maximum. The, on the neutral, I'm sorry, uh, yes, and the neutral axis was zero. Here, reverse. On top and bottom are zero. Is it linear? Before you go, come on, guys. You gave me five minutes. Let's say it's quiz time. Okay, <laughs> give me five minutes. Don't run around. I have a lot of things. Talk, talk. To you. What is this linear or is it parabola? Linear. What is Q is linear? Q is oh. equal area times distance. No, actually, this is what you have to understand that this is changing. The stresses is here, so you have to understand that. Here again, one more time. It's zero, yes, it keep increasing, yes. On the neutral axis is the, but the intensity of that is a parabola because you are changing it with Q and T. Everybody, it is not linear, it's not Y. It is Q, which is YDA, no way. So keep increasing. In, with a parabola format is being shown there. Next time I'm going to do all the example. And also don't forget that if your beam is layered, then what you have to do? You have to put nail or bolt in order to avoid that from sliding on top of each other. That's why we do it. In the, for example, you have a home, wood home, plywood, you put nail there. The nail has to be in certain distance. Otherwise, it's going to slide. And that's why it become old. It's going to do that, and that's very great noises. You top, or you are on top of that. You bend it, but the beam, the, the things will plywood will like. Anyhow, we talk.